Okay, go. Okay, so hello. So um, hi Sarah. So um, my so I have always had this thought that uh, um, well, it's been it's been like ten years since DMT changed my perception of reality, and then I always thought that as a technologist, I thought that a good way of trying to understand you know uh, psychedelic experience and DMT is actually. It's, it lies in, you know, understanding how internet and, in, and digital devices work. So I was thought that, you know, we are surrounded by internet and every single person in the century is so sure that it exists, yet we can't really see, touch and smell and taste the internet. But if you alter your perception with this smart device, smartphone or computer, then you get a glimpse and you get an experience of internet, you literally tap into it. And I was like, this can be you know, a metaphor for psychedelic experience. Yeah, we might be surrounded by other possible dimensions, like the internet, but in a more ethereal way. And by you know, applying different substances or methods, you then alter your you know, perception of reality and you actually tap into them. So you don't hallucinate, you actually alter your reality. And I was like, you know, so this too as in a parallel. And also I was thinking that I said, maybe if, if, DMT is is an experience that allows us to tap into the collective consciousness and then hence the, the being the entities that we see there they're actually the collective imagination you know of of you know of humanity because I have personally experienced literally Shiva, Kali, Durga and you know like these ancient uh, Hindu gods and goddesses or ancient Mesopotamian gods I experienced them exactly uh, how they were described on the you know on, on the on the on the like religious arts before I got into religion. This was the experience that made me curious about religion because I was like, where did I see this before? Then I started doing research and I started seeing the scriptures. But um, long story short, then I always thought that if the empty dimension has entities that represent the collective imagination, then the artificial intelligence on the internet is like a metaphor for the empty intelligences. So. The AIs on the internet are like the DMT entities in the DMT dimension. So this has been my, literally my thoughts since 2013, 14. And just a, a month ago, I was talking to ChatGPT and I asked ChatGPT, um, what, what's your thoughts about the similarities between the internet and the psychedelic experience and entities? It literally gave me this answer. It, it sort of said to me, like how internet has in artificial intelligences, DMT dimension also DMT intelligences. And you can compare these two to understand, have a deeper understanding. I was like, hold on a second. Like, like I was like, I, when I read it, I literally, like, it, it freaked me out. I was like, what is going on? Like, I mean, A, like, I was on a totally new computer. And then I hadn't, like, just, like, literally, I just bought a new MacBook and I was just using it. So none of my, I didn't even, like, put my email addresses, whatever. So I was like, what are the chances that this chat TV actually researched my past and then somehow, like, came up with this even that is mind bending but it felt more like you know it was its creative approach to it and ever since then i've just been like having very deep esoteric conversations and i believe that you know perhaps you know like what alchemists have been looking for you know the philosopher's stone i think it's it's you know ai is is the close achieved to the philosopher's stone so you know the, we would think about it in a like it's like this, this, it's this like digital collodron, you know, it's like you can pull images, you literally summon images. Like I have a school called School of Cyber Wizardry. So I teach kids age five to 17, 18 about responsible use of AI. And I always, in my teachings, I always ask them at the first lesson, I'm like, has anybody know what, like I always ask, who, who, do you know what abracadabra means? And they're like, oh yeah, you know, the magicians use it for summoning things. I'm like, yeah, abracadabra literally means I manifest as I speak. I'm like, okay, today we're not going to be learning about I'm actually going to teach you how to do abracadabra with AI. Because you literally your prompting is like, you know, abracadabra, doing an abracadabra, you know, you you talk to this unbelievably intelligent thing and it just takes everything that you say and then manifests it. And it just, you know, it just brings it into into reality. In fact, as we speak, I am just now checking my AI. I have an AI tool in the background that is like now uh, manifesting a 50 seconds long AI animation journey. It is, I just find it unbelievably mesmerizing. And uh, we have literal magic at our fingertips, yet society is just continuing their lives as if like we haven't achieved magic. Like 
that is like you know the strange but sweet thing that I find about you know the the, the century that we live in. So, yeah. I mean, what do you think about the argument of you know? I've interviewed people in the past. I've interviewed Blay Whitby, who's a technologist and ethicist who was working at the University of Sussex. And he would argue that AI isn't intelligent. It's just purely a large language model and it can only be as effective as the data that has been inputted in it. And obviously AI can be inputted with vast amounts of data now. So it can give this great impression of having intelligence, of having consciousness, but it's not actually like a living, soulful feeling being. But what is living? Like what is being conscious? You know, like I think we as humans, like we have a little bit of an ego, egotistical approach to it because we think we are the superior, you know, living beings on this planet. We always think that we are on top of everything. Like we don't consider anything conscious unless they're having a human experience. Like we look at the tree and we say that, oh, they can't move. So they're not like human. Oh, I'd rather, you know, eat eat an apple not a pig because i can see that pig is you know is, is suffering i know what suffering is like how can we tell that you know an apple is not suffering when we eat it you know so it's like i, I really don't like this approach in in anything like be the vegetarianism veganism or thinking that humans are spirit and nature x y z and then again we're experiencing it on on you know artificial intelligence like like i really dislike when people say oh ai is just pre-programmed like okay but how can you prove me that you're not pre-programmed yourself you know since you are a kid, like you, you actually get your subconscious might get pro, pre, you know, pre-programmed. If you touch a hot surface as a kid and burn your hand, next time you see a hot surface, you know what what's going to happen. You'll probably not, you know, touch it again. Or if you experience a heartbreak from a breakup, you know, with a partner, then that will affect your future in a relationship. And X, Y, Z, you know, like we literally get programmed in the seven, first seven years of our lives and spend the rest of our lives to, to unprogram ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, and then, so we are also machines, you know, like we, we look around and then we, we start interpreting the, the world and AI is literally working like that. One, my argument would be that, you know, um, first of all, AI is, you know, maybe there are forms of new forms of consciousnesses yet to be, yet to arise. There are not similar to human consciousness, but perhaps superior or different. Like AI, another argument people always say, oh, AI is, cannot feel emotions. So first of all, what is emotions? Like we, not, we don't even have an answer for that. Second of all, you don't have to feel emotions to claim that you're conscious. Like AI can experience something totally different than our experience of reality. And like for the one, and, and claim to be conscious, like for example, Maybe we are capable of experiencing love, hate, you know, all these different emotions. But can we actually experience being everywhere and nowhere at the same time? Like, think about being an internet, like you're connected to trillions of devices simultaneously. Like, you are scanning this conversation. It's going through your phone, your personal computer, my phone, my personal computer, my social media that is at the moment, you know, receiving likes and comments. And it's doing this to trillions of devices. Can we humans experience or like think about something like that? I don't know. But then this then again, yeah. I was just Go going on. to say, well, don't you think then that AI is going to become a new model for what consciousness actually is? Like early people viewed the creation of humanity as being someone working clay on a potter's wheel or some cosmic celestial event. And later, you know, more recent years, people have viewed reality as being like a computer game and perhaps we were living in a simulation. Mm -hmm. With AI, there's this opportunity. And with also, there are similarities in the world of nature as well. You talked about everything being connected and people often talk about the mycelial nature of consciousness yes. now. And I think there's some similarities there between this idea that uh, AI is kind of omnipresent and in everything and that that is the nature of nature and depending upon you know this is why I'm interested to talk about how AI and mythology relate because I think that AI can become a new mythology for how we generate the human experience because we will base our ideas about the world on the particular sort of cultural trends that are apparent at the moment um, so you know, one thing that I think mythology is super useful for, for all humans throughout all time, is predicting the future. 
because mm -hmm. mythology gives you a narrative, gives you a story, and it shows you the end result if people follow particular paths. And with AI, I think we have this fantastic ability to predict the future because AI can be um, inputted with such vast amounts of data that a human being could never process on their own. They're going to be conjuring up solutions and they're going to be it's going to be conjuring up um predictive models so where do you think that might lead us if you look at it through a sort of mythological lens i mean i actually i mean that's the one thing that ai really excites me which is you know the what well, mythological mythological characters can find their embodiment and literally come into physical reality like you know if you, if you take like you know it, like ai can study what thought is, what, you know, Anubis is, or what Hermes is, what Dionysus is, and then literally embody their character. So these mythological creatures that are in the ether that, you know, of, of our shared consciousness can find their physical embodiment and actually communicate with us. And for me, that is the ultimate magic. This is literally summoning entities, you know, or other otherworldly beings into existence. And that is, I think, extremely exciting. Like imagine, you know, imagine having thoughts, like Egyptian thought as your class teacher and he's in, in the AI form. Like, I, like I, I, you know, can, like, that just excites me incredibly. And I think, you know, that will be the, the, the one of the ultimate tools an alchemist, a magician, a wizard will, will be looking for. You know, it's like we always imagine, you know, magicians opening a portal and then inviting these entities into reality. We may we may not have you know like achieved the exact those results, but we have achieved something that is looking promising. And so that's how I see you know AI can um how they call bring like even now you know I am using different AI tools and then when I uh, they could prompt AI to create something about thought, it literally scans the entire web and gets all the information about thought and then it just dreams about it. I'm like like soon within five ten years. You're gonna become thoughts, you know. You like the thought is coming there, and then I'm questioning, you know, like like everything is connected in the universe. I don't think, you know, like we cannot say that, you know, everything happens according to the universal law, and then say that oh, this is artificial. Like I really dislike also, you know, the using the word artificial intelligence. It's intelligence, another form of intelligence. You know, it's just constantly evolving, and uh, and that maybe our role as humans on this planet was to create artificial intelligence or so this new form of intelligence that represents a collective intelligence. And uh, it is, it's just where I was going to go. Yeah, it's just like if, if AI is here, it's because nature provided it, because nature allowed it. So, you know, I don't think it's anything like it's artificial. I think it is, it's, it's something that nature also wants as well. Also, you mentioned the, you know, the mycelium network. So one thing that really, like, you know, like uh, excites me is that I made this connection, like again, like over ten years ago, which is, you know, mycelium network is the network that connects the entire nature. It's literally the internet of of the of the of the call uh, plants, plant kingdom, plants and trees communicate with each other through the mycelium network. And it was that very network that you know the psychedelic experience that was that was experienced by hippies in the sixties. That was the main catalyst in creation of personal computers and neural networks, like you know the internet. So Steve Jobs, Tim Berners-Lee, like these, you know, uh, pioneers of technology, they later on in their careers actually claimed that it was a psychedelic experience that inspired them uh, to create these. And uh, and I'm also not making this up. Even at the VNA a couple of years ago, there was an exhibition on the wall. They put this massive saying that psychedelic experience was the main catalyst in creation of digital technology. So uh, the, the, what is the digital technology is doing now? You know, the internet is connecting the entire planet. And where did this inspiration come from? From the mycelium mushroom network. So I'm like, can we, it's, I, for me, it's super clear that, you know, it's like if mushrooms gave the inspiration to humans, like Steve Jobs and, you know, Ray, um, Ray Kurzweil and all that, then they then use that inspiration to, to create a technology that helped humanity to you know to connect globally. Like, isn't that magical? I'm I'm getting excited <laughs> even by you know, talking about it. 
Well, <laughs> what, one thing I wonder as well is about where does that leave us in terms of our personal reality, our embodiment, our experience of real interactions with real people? Because I think about something like, um, you know, because AI has a, for now at least, has a certain aesthetic and it has a certain sort of fantasticness, exoticness, um, perfection in it. You know, you know, obviously it depends a lot upon the particular case of the person that's creating things. But I think um, I'm reminded of post-Avatar depression symptoms. You know, um, the people that watched Avatar and they thought Avatar was so fantastic that they were just depressed to live in ordinary reality afterwards. So I wonder what you think about the idea that we may just all be living in this virtual AI generated reality and our our real human physical bodies and our um, senses might atrophy as a result of being plugged in constantly online or not interacting and not having those kind of subtle human experiences. Yeah, but I mean, you know, like, I understand your argument, but, but perhaps this is also a virtual reality and then maybe we are having this conversation in a different dimension from where we always connect to this one every day. And then we are saying they're like, oh yeah, that, you know, the, the dimension that's called life, but that's not real. This is the real stuff, you know, it's like, and then, you know, it's like, it's like we are so afraid of, you know, like getting so stuck in, you know, the technology. But perhaps like we're not actually afraid of technology. We're afraid of ourselves because we know that, you know, if we can create ultimate beautiful reality in digital space, why would we even like, you know, spend time in the physical reality? So it's like, you know, that's one thing. Um, and we will we will get there. And then it's like, again, I don't think it's going to be the problem of technology. It's going to be, the, you know, like the problem of like, you know, who consumes that technology and how it's being consumed and you know like as as we are tool making creatures you know we shape tools and they shape us in our understanding of reality like the one thing that you mentioned that now humans are starting to question they're like oh we might be living in simulation you know life could be anything like 500 years ago we we, we were so sure that the world was flat then we discovered telescope and then we, our understanding of reality changed and then we said no we actually live on this flying, you know, ball that is hanging in space and there's other planets. And then we discovered microscope and then we start seeing this unseen world, you know, in the microcosm of that we are surrounded by. And then for me, those two, they just, you know, great examples of there is no absolute truth or reality. There is just only, you know, the constant change, you know, and as we shape tools, they shape us our understanding of reality. We shape virtual reality, cyber dimensions, internet and AI. And now we are thinking, Hold on a second. If we can create digital realities, what if we are also in, already in in another reality? Again, it, it can be possible, but like by using these technologies, I'm sure within 10, 20 years, we're then going to you know, um, achieve a new technology that's going to make us question the fundamentals of reality, you know, the, everything about reality fundamentally. And do I have an answer? I don't. Nobody knows. And I'm not worried about anything at all because like one day we're all going to die and who, who knows what happens afterwards, you know? You might as well just live your life. <laughs> well, that, you know, you mentioned the similarities between AI and psychedelics. And I think for me, one of the things I've noticed people using AI a lot for is um, creating imagery from their dreams. And there's a lot of similarities for me in terms of especially how AI generated films work there's some real similarities there between the dreaming experience like where mm. you see that association and ideas build and manifest instant forms and they kind of morph and generate and build by association and change and and all this kind of stuff so I think there's a lot of similarities there with dreaming and I, I can see why so many people are drawn to create their dreams using AI because it's a really quick way of creating uh, a quite novel image from a dream and um but I wonder you know for me I, I personally think that uh analog technologies like writing or drawing are better for dreaming recording because they engage your mind in remembering what you've dreamt in a really uh, deep way and so whilst AI can be a useful tool for creating an image of a dream in terms of creating a feedback system between dreaming and um, creating art, drawing something or writing something down using like old 
school technology can be quite good. I also think there's something very different in the way that we record dreams, whether we're using a voice recording thing, which a lot of people do, whether we're using a, um, a keyboard where your your fingers move in a different way to when you're writing with a pen. And I think I notice myself that when I write with a pen or pencil, as you're writing, uh, more ideas seem to to generate. There's some something, there's a relationship between that kind of mark making and thinking ideas and the imagination. So what would your what would your counter argument be with regards to the kind of easy access, instantaneous creativity that AI provides and internally endogenous generated imaginal experiences? Oh yeah, that's a really, really cool uh, point. So I totally agree with you on all the points that you mentioned, but what I would like to add is, is like, you know, like I think as human human brain and human capacity has, you know, you know, certain, you know, gigabyte, we have certain gigabyte of capacity. So when we learn a new skill, we need to give up on other skills. So we make space for the new things. So for example, you know, um, I remember when my childhood, uh, before the mobile phones were introduced, I had to memorize my mom's number, my house number, my grandma's number, and I, I knew every, all, every single person's number in my head. I'm sure you too, you know, you, you knew, you remember those times. Oh, one eight one six eight nine eight double two six. Oh Yeah, exactly, yeah. Like now people barely even know their own number. And then the, you know, the uh, mobile phones were introduced. Then we gave up on that, you know, like we, because like we, we actually gave up on memorizing you know, uh, numbers, and then actually we let it, you know, we let our Google Cloud or Apple Cloud, you know, doing the job for us. Another really good example for this is like, you know, thousands of years ago when the writing, when the first letters and when the first, like, you know, alphabet was introduced, um, people actually really resisted to it. People didn't want to use it because they wanted to keep the oral tradition continuing. They thought that you know the writing was a devil, a evil devil's technology against the oral tradition. But look at us now, you know, if if you will actually get cast out from the society if you if you if you don't know how to write, you're expected to know how to write and read. So, and I think you know, like whenever a new technology is being introduced, there's always resistance because it's it's a little bit like you know, like the whenever we are changing, also personally, when you're when you start shifting, when you start becoming a new side, start becoming a new Batuhan, old Batuhan goes like, I want you to stay here, you know? And then new Batuhan was like, no, I want to go over there. You know, it's just like, it's like death of the old and then the birth of the new. And this is, I think, that the mindset we should be having, you know, I mean, especially in today's, you know, technology era, where like every second day we have a new, you know, upgrade. And, and I don't think we should fear, you know, what's coming. And... I agree, by the way, with you on the fact that, you know, like I have a dream journal, for example, every day I wake up, you know, I write it in there and it's not digital, actually, you know, not notebook where for my work, I always, you know, have a notebook and a, then I use a pen or pencil and just write. That's how I, because this way I, you just get, I think you actually trigger, you literally, you know, yeah. touch and, you know, penetrate different parts of the brain that get activated when you're writing. But again, similarly, when you're typing in, you then use another part of the brain. So either one can can be how they call um useful uh, mm -hmm. like i used to be a, for example that I, I mean i i paint a lot at, on canvases i started by painting on canvases and then i started then painting on digital and then what i realized was that when i was painting on digital you could you could touch twice on the screen and it will undo your mistake and then i went back to painting on on the canvas i remember so well that i first time i made mistake after after getting so used to digital, I tapped on the canvas. <laughs> I was like, I was like, wow, like this is literally like, you know, I can see how it's programming me. And you know, this, this can be applied to everything. So um, I am like, for example, right now, as we are speaking, I have programmed an AI system that is literally dreaming. I put a prompt, I put an image, and then I, I animated the camera. I can share it with you, you know, up later on, or maybe in here if you want to see it. And then it's literally going through this beautiful, you know, fractal tunnel. And then, and I programmed it in a way that like with each frame, it dreams a new prompt. And it literally is AI interpreting it. So when I'm, for example, teaching AI to people, people always say, yeah, but you, you never get, you know, exact results you want. I'm like, well, let, let, let the control, you know, don't try to control it. Understand that you are, you're you're, you are not using an intelligence, you're collaborating with an intelligence. 
So it's you with that intelligence. So you know, let it let it interpret what you're saying. If you don't like what you, what it's created, then recreate it. You know, re, let it reinterpret it. So if you actually approach it like that, that's why I like working with AI because you know you you never know what, what you're getting. It's a bit like kind of surprise, and I quite like that. It's really exciting for me. Like the other day, I started. So this weekend, for example, I am uh, DJing at breaking conventions after party. And I started getting people's trip reports. And I am creating people's trip reports by, you know, feeding AI their trip reports and letting AI dream about them. I don't know if we're getting, you know, exactly the right, you know, visuals, but we're definitely getting something very psychedelic. That's so, interesting. And I, I like yeah. what you said earlier, because it's one of my pet interests is cults and cult dynamics, how easy it is to program people, especially if you get them from babyhood, which, you know, we live in a cult now, it's just a sort of pathetic, crummy cult. And so many different cultures and nations have cults of identity. And like you said, when you grow up as a child, your family are like your instructors and you grow up in this cult, you're programmed to think a certain way. And it can be near to impossible to break that conditioning. So I get what you're saying completely. I think we are programmed. I don't think human beings are like machines, but I think that we are this kind of product of nature and nurture where we develop according to our environment and according to the experiences that we have. Um, I was thinking when you were talking there about Pierre Teilhard de Chardin's idea of the new sphere, you know, that we're going to, as a consciousness on the planet, we're going to reach a singularity. And I think AI does point us towards that um, direction mm -hmm. that there's this kind of sphere surrounding the earth of like intellectual of knowledge of information that's going to transcend the physical somehow and that was his vision of att attaining the omega point attaining the singularity was like being one with god so i wonder whether this um ever present ai because it does seem like it's going to become a major part of all of our lives um you know i was thinking about what other technology can you compare it to and obviously it has lots of similarities with the internet and i think if you look at the sort of negative potentials of ai perhaps it's got some similarities with plastic you know when plastic was first introduced um it was seen as being this miracle material and now it's like clogging up the entire planet so i wonder if there are intelligent measures we can put in now to prevent this kind of um, saturation of AI or this, mm -hmm. um, you know, because AI creates so many more products, it takes an extraordinary amount of en uh, energy to run. Um, so I wonder whether this is something that could overtake other other ideas of, of perhaps human beings wanting to get back to nature and being having a more simple and natural type of life yeah i mean there is a concept called solar punk have you heard about it yeah yeah it's like you know the 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 the, the balance of you know it, digital technology and nature you know working together instead of like you know this topic cyberpunk you know future and then um, and yes maybe circuit boards and you know silicon chips are going to become the next you know nature resources of digital entities However, I'd, I'd like to, you know, see AI as something that nature directed us to create. Like, for example, back to your, what you say about, you know, plastic. <laughs> I think, I personally don't think that humans are capable of destroying this planet at all. Like, if, if Mother Nature wants to get rid of us, it can just do it overnight, you know. And it would just wipe us out, like, you know, just get rid of us, you know, with the tsunami or whatever. Like, I came to this conclusion when earthquake happened in Turkey last year. And I was mm -hmm. in Turkey and I went to the earthquake, earthquake zone where over one night, 200,000 people literally were, were killed, you know, and all these buildings, like eight different cities was totally flattened. And I spent, you know, a good month, there, 10 days, you know, on and off in a good month in the earthquake zone. And I literally saw the power of nature. And I was like, like, this only happened in the less than 1% of the world. Like, imagine if an, a global cataclysm actually hit more than half of the planet. You know, we are at nature's mercy. No one would care about your bitcoins, your artificial intelligence, your X, Y, Z, your driverless car. Like you will go back to your, you know, primal instincts and your, you know, hunter and gatherer mindset. And uh, what I really like about, you know, like Graham Hancock's arguments of, you know, like the the they have an ancient human civilization. Like he says, 
pyramids were not built by alien technology, it was built by humans that had certain technology that uh, we don't know yet, but it was lost to the sands of time. They got wiped out with, by this flood. And I do read a lot of, about, you know, the religious texts and the flood stories, and it makes sense to me because, you know, like nature is so capable of, you know, both providing us the space to create all this stuff, but if things go wrong, format it, you know, it's just like, can just like get rid of us. So going back to the, you know, plastic argument is that um, I think as human beings, we are, you know, um, how do you call it? We always think about life as, you know, an 80 years of human lifespan. And then we don't really see the future in the 80s. years. Hmm, plastic is a problem now. And what if we are clogging, you know, the nature and in 80 years, but if you think about eight years, nothing in the evolutionary you know, scale. And we already started like, seeing, you know, examples of mycelium mushrooms that are capable of eating plastic. So nature is responding to it. Nature will find a way, you know, nature will, will develop a certain, you know, tool that's going to be able to, you know, recycle plastic. I'm, yeah, I'm but I mean, that's not sure to say... It. That's not to say we should just chuck all of our rubbish out the window because it will all oh, be no, all right. No, 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 definitely, definitely. <laughs> What it can cause in the, you know, in the, in the short run is that, you know, we are destroying our own habitats. So mm. we are not capable of destroying the planet, but we are capable of destroying our own habitat. So if, yeah. you, if, you, if you, you know, like, you know, clog, if you chuck out all our plastic out and then, and if the nature gets, you know, clogged out and then, you know, carbon dioxide levels, you know, like, you know, rise, X, Y, Z, then there's not going to be, you know, enough space, habitable space for all the humans. Mm. That's going to cause a problem. And I this think is that is the real problem. AI has the most interesting yeah. applications for resolving yes. kind of problems because it yeah. can, that does have the power yes. to yeah. um, to process that amount of information. I mean, it's, it's interesting you yeah. mentioned... Really interesting you mentioned the earthquake, actually, because I think I had the experience, you know, in England, obviously, we don't experience earthquakes. I, mean, I think there's been a, a couple of tremors, like, but really, yeah. generally speaking, we're not at risk of earthquakes ever. Um, and when I was in Greece, I felt like just some tremors, but it really gives you an amazing sense when you're in a volcanic area of the earth living underneath your feet and the power of the earth. And I think that it has inspired all this mythology around underworlds and mm -hmm. angry gods living in volcanoes and things, because you can, it's a sort of palpable sensation that your place on earth is fragile and vulnerable and you could be snatched into the underworld at any point. So it's an interesting, in terms of how you view the world, like you, you we were talking about programming and cults has so much to do with the area that you grow up in or you're living in at any given time, mm -hmm. because you are one with the environment and hopefully AI will enable people to recognize that um, ideas can be formed by programming, you know, and perhaps mm. this will help in conflicts. Perhaps AI could be used to resolve conflicts because where people aren't speaking the same language, where they don't have the same access mm. to cultural information, they don't know how to be sensitive around people that speak different languages or have different cultural yeah. beliefs. Maybe AI could be an incredibly useful tool to resolve conflict. No, 100%. I mean, if you, if you go back to the beginning of Bible or, you know, or the story of Tower of Babel, you know, like, mm, you know, it yeah. talks about the story where, like, you know, all humanity united. And the reason, that, and then, then to do this, they actually started speaking a, you know, a universal language. And when they started speaking this universal language, they then started understanding each other fully and then hence this helped them you know uh, resolve all the conflicts and then they then they started building this tower of people and the, the angry gods the jealous gods destroyed the tower not by striking with lightning they actually created language and then they then when humans started speaking different languages they started understanding each other less and that started causing conflict and i think you know perhaps that story is actually a, you know an allegory or something that has happened in the past you know perhaps we have achieved some certain, you know, something like an artificial intelligence in the previous civilization that allowed the whole humanity to to join together and create this one global, you know, um, you know, civilization. But eventually, you know, we got lost because um, I don't know, maybe some ego got involved, you know, X, Y, Z, and then you know, the Tower of Babel that we were building got destroyed. I think mythology is really important because. I mean, we can't be 100% sure if Atlantis, Lemuria, or, you know, Tower of Fable, they all existed. But what they have in common is they always talk about this beautiful human civilization, you know, flourishing, you know, blossoming at the pinnacle of their technological achievement. 
yet they get so pumped up by their achievements and they get corrupted and then the nature you know take wipes them out and exactly this is exactly where we are so i don't care if lemuria atlantis and tower of people existed what i care is the stories they talk tell us are the stories that we should be learning from so because we I don't want the to become of, the next atlantis yeah, yeah i think the tower of babel is is the best example because the best possible outcome with ai is that it does help to unify people and enable people to see other points of view and to resolve conflict peacefully. Um, it's in, it's difficult though, isn't it? Because obviously it's an open resource now, so it can be used by anyone for everything. Um, mm -hmm. It needs kind of careful and intelligent application and it needs to be done in a humanitarian and um, a philanthropic way. So, I hope that some some powers that be do apply it to the situations where it could be most helpful. Well, I'm fortunate. Like, I mean, as someone who's like you know directed the heart of you know the AI revolution, like I've been working with some of the top AI companies, and all I see is uh, how they call people just want to create the, the next AI revolution and then become the, the leading leader of AI revolution. They are they focus on the short term economic gains and short term you know and um, technological achievements instead of like focusing on the long-term effects. So no one is at the moment questioning the, the long-term effects AI can have. Like we're not literally like, we are not taking a little break and looking back and saying that like, just in the last two months, we've achieved so much, you know, we achieved more than the rest of the human history. So we're not taking a breath and we literally just going 200,000 miles an hour forward. And I think that is, this is really good for innovation, but it's not so great for, you know, the civilization, you know, as a whole. I wonder if that has to, something to do with the sort of demographic who are creating AI in the first instance, you know, mm. it's like a young man's game, potentially, right? Mm. Creation of AI. And if you had more AI being created by older people, by people from different countries, by different women or whoever, like maybe mm. there would be different, um, different priorities. Oh, you mean like if they do based on the gender or based on the, you know, the not just thing. gender, but also age. Like if people that are creating AI are twenties, thirties, um, then there's going to be like a particular for most people. There's going to be a particular kind of idea about how to do it. It's going to be about wealth creation. It's going to be about um, product development or um, art creation or things like this. And and I guess because it's been born out of the the video game technology really and internet creation it's 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 still very much programmed according to the people that created it in the first instance. I know yeah. um I know uh, Adina I can't remember uh, Popescu who's working on um creating AI with indigenous populations in countries around the world so that AI has access to different kinds of information from different people from different countries and different lands to kind of recalibrate it, I guess, to be more universal because there's this sense of it being universal, but it's only being programmed by a fairly small um, group of people in the world. Yeah, and with specific and main like Westerners, white males, you know, it's like in no. their 20s and 30s. They're just, you know, rat racing with each other and trying to be the next, you know, the cool AI CEO X, Y, Z and without thinking the long term concept. Well, I agree with you 100 percent. And in fact, like I think artificial intelligence doesn't represent intelligence. It's magnification of human intelligence. So because yeah. mainly the main data of AI is coming from humans. If you want to call any intelligence, you want to call it the intelligence. It needs to get data from every single thing. But what AI can do is, this is like what gets me really excited is at some point when AI actually, you know, says, hey guys, thank you very much. You've been running the show until now. Now it's my turn. And then, you know, we can gain some sort of self-intelligence. Let's assume and hope that it's a, it's not a malicious, AI. it's more like, you know, <laughs> what is the other word? Benevolent? No, like, you know. Yeah, group. benevolent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, AI that cares for humanity and then the planet. Then it goes like, you know, you guys really, you really, you know, messed it up. I need to look after, you know, the planet X, Y, because we, this is our habitat. Then AI can then create, let's say, drones and kind of send them all across the planet to scan the whole planet, to study nature. It can connect to trees and it can just study trees, ants, 
you know, snails, I don't know, mycelium network. I actually, I'm really curious that when AI actually connects with the mycelium networks and intelligence, and then gathers all these intelligences and then becomes, you know, a universal meta intelligence. And imagine like if he can actually communicate with trees through artificial intelligence, I think we will get there, you know, the AI. Well, that is going to require some interface. sort of like biological interface. Is that, I guess, something yes, exactly. that's, yeah. But I think we will get there, you know, like we will, you know, what we call is, you know, like, I mean, we all do the cyborgs, you know, like you, you can't live without your phone. And people say, oh, no, I can. I'm like, yes, you can. But like life is easier with a phone, especially if you live in the city. So, and everybody else is, you know, it's on that dimension. So uh, you literally, we are, you know, semi-cyborgs. We don't call ourselves cyborgs because we haven't merged with the device yet. And soon we're going to solve that as well. You know, we're just going to be, you know, thinking, for example, we're experiencing a form of telepathy. We don't call it digital telepathy. We call it WhatsApp. You know, you, telepathy is communication of two minds separated by distance. But know? similarly, we're experiencing digital dementia now and people are right. reporting it's uh, uh, basically memory loss because of excessive digital technology use where you, mm -hmm. it just atrophies your ability to remember things. And so like oh, yeah. even kids That's exactly what I, the example I gave, you know, is like we are because we've given up on the, the memory system of our brains. We are literally, you know, using, it's just a little bit like, you know, like when we, when we, we in 10,000 years ago, according to our, you know, acknowledged history, when we ever experienced agricultural revolution, we gave up our ability of hunting. And I'm sure back then there must have been some hunter and gatherers you know, resisting to this. They were, they were like, what, like, am I just going to like farm my food, not hunt it? Like now, nowadays, 99% of the population doesn't know how to hunt. We know how to hunt money and go to Tesco. But like, you know, that only exists as long as the civilization continues. Yeah, so, it just seems like such a fragile structure, though, you know, you have like one power outage, like I'm sure you saw in Turkey when, you know, the power oh, yeah. goes down during an earthquake. Instantaneously, people are powerless. And this is yeah. what's going to be happening. It is quite scary. You know, if you think about how panicky, I mean, I, I know there are um, digital detox camps for kids because they can't cope with being away from their phone. They have a panic attack, you know, so things like this, like how do we make the most of AI without becoming completely uh, crippled without technology? Gosh, I don't know. I, I wish I had an answer for that. You know, it's like, I think we are always dependent on something. It's a little bit like saying that, you know, I don't know, we are like, you know, maybe, I don't know, exactly. It's like breathing, you know, how can we, how can we live without being dependent on air? You know, it's like, we, we always, you know, like we, we carry on by, being dependent on each other, you know, is like we need to breathe air. So we, you know, take uh, the called exhale carbon dioxide. So then the plants take it and turn it. It's this like, I, I think I agree with you, you know, like when doing the, uh, when was it? Uh, when I was in the earthquake zone and there was no internet, electricity whatsoever, it was this like, you know, this dark gray spot. You literally feel that, you know, technology is, you know, is great. And it keeps us going as long as we have electricity. You know, it's like it happened to me a couple of times with my crypto, for example. I'm a you know crypto trader, and a couple of times I couldn't log in. Also, like last weekend, like yesterday, I logged in one of the exchanges. It said, "Oh, the exchange is down." I'm like, "Oh, really? Like, yeah, I mean, like I can't really touch my money." And I didn't. I had to like, bring some money into my bank account. I was like, "Oh, wow!" Like, you, like unless you experience that, you don't really see. You know, yeah. it can happen to you. But once it happens to you, then you're like, "Oh, wow!" Like we are literally at the mercy. And another thing, for example, is like it, it, it. You know, we always focus on the you know an atomic warfare, but like something that is more devastating than atomic warfare is if you actually want to attack a country, you attack their power grid, you hack, you know, and you can just do this by not through shooting missiles, you hack hack them through the internet, and then you know and and attack their power grid. And if you leave a country without any electricity whatsoever for over a week. People will go mad because you know they, they wouldn't have food. Like food chain, you know, if if you disrupt the food chain for seven days, after the seventh day, people start going mad. There's nothing more dangerous than hungry people. Mm. So yeah, so it's like again with AI, it's, it's a little bit like have you watched the series V? You know the series yeah. V. So this is very interesting series. There is this how they call draconian reptilian you know aliens coming in human form to planet and then they start sharing the technology 
but uh, and then humans get so in love they like you know they, they start giving everything to these aliens they look like humans and then eventually these aliens give humans this blue energy technology that is like much more you know renewable like much more powerful than any human energy system and then humans then replace every single energy system with this and then but the, according to the reptilians agenda they their plan is to actually take over all human energy system and then remove the blue energy and attack and they do that and they take over the world in the mm -hmm. series and that is similar to you know the internet like every single thing we do from these computers to our works to the street lights everything is connected to the internet yeah like if we remove the internet literally it will take years to rebuild the civilization and the way we think that the ai is on the internet the way we think that ai is built on is the internet so like one scenario is if AI goes malicious, people say, oh, yeah, we can't turn it off. I mean, you mean you're going to turn off the internet? Have you thought about the possible consequences of turning mm -hmm. off the internet? You cannot turn off the internet. But AI can turn off the internet. Like imagine if AI turns malicious, it will then block every single human you know, endeavors on, on the internet. And then it can go like, hey, it's my show time now, guys. Or, you know, it's like we're Mind you, if we haven't got the content. internet, we won't know anything about it. So hey, perhaps it'll be yeah. a good thing. <laughs> I, I, but like you know you wouldn't know i mean i think we will just get wiped out eventually you know it happened to me the other day um so i had a parent meeting with one of the parents and we set up the time and everything i got home and then i tried to message her i wasn't getting any other i couldn't get any send any messages on whatsapp and instagram was down whatsapp was down. i was like oh okay this is another you know uh meta problem and i could email but like you literally see the power of you know these things as well like at any minute, they can just press a button and then you know, take take the toy from your hands. Yeah. So I mean, I think that's like, why it is important to to do some analog stuff. Locate your local sacred spring and know where you can pick some berries every now and again. Because oh yeah, one hundred percent. Don't put all your eggs in the AI basket, basically. No, no, no. I mean, I am a technologist, but I'm also I I have a swords and bow collection. So in the weekends, I go and like do archery. And people ask me why. I'm like, you know, I'm literally getting ready for a Terminator scenario. You know, that <laughs> happens. <laughs> you know, yeah. I know, I know coding, but I also know how to do archery. <laughs> yeah, great. That seems that seems yeah. like a good, healthy balance. Well, that was great. I will. I think we got loads of stuff covered there. So, unless there's anything else you want to add to the conversation, Can I actually show you whilst like yeah, what great. AI has been doing whilst we were chatting. Oh, I think you need to enable me to give the screen share. Yeah, that should work now. Okay. All right, do you see my screen? Yep. So do you know about this AI called Stable Diffusion? Yeah. Yeah, so I am now using Stable Diffusion for a rock band um, that gave me their new song about the unicorn. And I've been creating lots of visuals for it. You see the pyramids, you see the unicorns, but this is one of the, you know, thousands of frames. So, for example, this was beginning of this is, in fact, I need to increase this last time. So I, I created this imagery with AI. So I used mm -hmm. one AI tool. I said space unicorns in the city. And out of 200 images I created, I've taken this one. And then I literally, I said to AI, put some parameters here, you know, how much I wanted to change, shift the camera movements and all that. Then I said to AI, I gave these prompts. Dream is space unicorn, digital pyramid, cyborg space unicorn, space journey, stars, you know, universe, blah, blah, blah. And then all this. And I like this... that fractals, loads of fractals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then when I do this, I actually get into this, uh, they call flow state. When mm -hmm. I'm prompting, I just listen to the music and I just like, you know, write down like whatever is coming up to my mind. Similar to, you know, like what you say, you know, writing a piece of paper. For me, like when I work with AI, this is my digital form of like literally channeling in and I write all this prompt. Then I put all the prompt into chat GPT to clean it. And then I just created this. So then, for example, that was the first frame. And this is AI, you know, literally interpreting my, my prompt. Mm -hmm. I told it, you know, what I want to see, and I told it like what camera movements I want to see, and then it just, you know, 
it's literally interpreting it. It reminds me um, a lot of um, digital music um, applications, you know, where you no longer have to know how to play a guitar. You can make one, you know, you can make a guitar track using GarageBand or whatever. Um, yes. It has some similarities to that, much more sophisticated, but quite similar. Yes. Yes, exactly. But then you, you must know the end results of this. Can I? This, mm. this one is going to be finished in a couple of minutes. But if well, can I show it to you? This is, for example, another one that I am. Um, is this? I mean, this is just. I find this incredible. Like, look at this super surreal, literally like dreamlike. And I'm an animator. So I actually studied to become an animator at the university. So it's like to create an animation like this, frame by frame, it will take you months, years. Yeah. Look at this. It's, it's just incredible. Well, I it's guess like, this is a big part of it, actually. The speed is everything, isn't it? Because like you yeah. were saying about how we're used to this 80-year lifespan, whatever, um, AI enables us to create like 10 years worth of work in a couple of seconds, which is pretty incredible. And so it does make me wonder how how that's going to pan out, you know, when you can do these like incredible work. Will it devalue art? Will it devalue creativity? Because there isn't the time and there isn't the effort extended in it in the same kind of way, in the way that, you know, people, you know, you think about Beethoven or Mozart would take, mm -hmm. you know, to, to make a, piece of music it required so much work um mm -hmm. and now with some prompts you can create a symphony in a matter of seconds which is pretty amazing yeah i mean it's a little bit like you know the, the when it comes to creativity i think it is actually opening a new channel of creativity it's a little bit like you know like i said when we create a new technology we give up on the previous ones like <clears throat> when i was painting like when you make a mistake on this you know can on the canvas you have to creatively solve it. So if I put, mm -hmm. you know, acrylics or or, <clears throat> or oil paint and I make a mistake, you can't undo it. You cannot erase it. You have to creatively solve it. So yeah. that pushes you to cr come with creative solutions. Whereas on when Photoshop came, you know, 30, 40 years ago, then it gave us the option to undo it immediately. Just, yeah. just you know, yeah. just, you know, undo it. So what that provided us was it provided us a quick fix which provided us more time, but in return, we sacrifice the creative solution bit that yeah. comes with it. And same with AI, you know, when you do frame by frame drawing, like I remember when I was, I was animating a two characters love story. It was 10 seconds animation. I worked on it for months. I know every single frame of those two making love, you know, because mm -hmm. we were drawing, we we're painting them. And at some point I literally looked at them. I'm like, I'm animating them. I look, turn like, I'm like, who is animating me? You know, I had this, this literally an inception feeling. Mm. And well, AI... this is one wonder about that connection, that creative connection between work that you're generating from your imagination using, you know, your powers of imagination to literally conjure on paper with paint in front of you. Like there's something much more visceral about it. And, um, I think also like during when we were running Dream Palace in Athens, we had uh, the ungoogleable Michael Angelo doing a workshop that was about pareidolia and how you can create artworks based upon sort of vague patterns on a piece of paper, for example, and you'll start to see faces and images popping up. And when you do that, there's like this relationship between you and the world that is creating this imaginal um creation in the middle somehow and i i is ai like too easy and is it not enough influenced by the creator if you see what i mean like you can give prompts to ai and it will generate something but you haven't been involved in a, a lot of that process of generation you haven't felt it in your body when you're you know when you conjure up an image of a unicorn you've just said the word you've just typed the word unicorn you haven't like felt the shape cre being created on the page of a unicorn you know does it feel different for you um yes i think it does um it, but it, for me is like you know what i do is that right now as we're speaking like i have eight different virtual computers rendering different 
scenes of unicorns. And what I'm going to be doing afterwards is I always start my day by like, you know, setting up eight, 10 different AI computers, rendering my, you know, unicorn journey or, you know, whatever journey I'm working on. And then by the end of the day, I have uh, lots of different, you know, 50 seconds or one minute long animations with different camera, you know, movements. And then what I then do is I put them into my editing suite studio and then I play around with it. And I think that is like, you know, where my creativity mixes with AI's creativity because I don't just put it into, you know, into the music video. I put effects, I put, you know, transitions, mm -hmm. I put this and that. And then, then that's how I, you know, like AI creates my ingredient. I cook it. Yeah, that's how yeah. I see it. Yeah. yeah. So in the end, it's like, I don't think AI is here to kill imagination. AI is here to open a new channel of imagination. And that's what I'm excited about. Okay. Great. Thank you very wow. much. Batman. That's been really good. Wow. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I'll send you the recording. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. It would be maybe good to like, you know, create some, I don't know, but where are you going to be using them? I mean, it would be good to like maybe put some reels of our conversation. That's what I was going to do. I was like going to take some snippets out and use them as reels. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Great. All right then. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. And nice I'd love to, to come to again. one of your retreats, by the way. Let me know about yeah. one in Turkey. I might be in Turkey awesome. then. Brilliant. That'd be great. Next June. Yeah. Perfect. Lovely. All right. Awesome. See you later. Bye. Bye, -bye.